Hello, everybody, and good afternoon, and welcome to the Mad International Voices, Voices, a project by the Bikote Institute and the Financial you know, Library and Sharing Institutions, IFLA. Uh, today, we'll be presenting to you uh, a webinar where we'll be discussing open access and infodemic exploring the global equity. Uh, we have renowned speakers amongst us today uh, with experience of years of experience shall be sharing with us practical knowledge on this uh, particular topic uh, for this conversation. Hello, dear participants and dear presenters. My name is Nilay, I'm from Turkey, and I am one of the last year's participants at the Emerging International Voices Network uh, Fellow, a, a joint project by Goethe Institute and IFLA, as you know. I'll be serving as your co-moderator today. Enjoy. And uh, my name is Damilari Oyedele. I'm a fellow of the Mali International Voices. I reside in Kigali, Rwanda, and I'll be co-moderating this session today. So um, before I just, we start sorry. the presentations, in order to avoid disturbances, uh, my colleague, uh, Nile, will give us some housekeeping we need to follow in order to make this uh, conversation uh, a very interesting and very good one. Nile, over to you. Thank you, Damlara. I have a few reminders. Uh, today's session is being recorded uh, to be available for viewing post uh, conference. And each presenter today has uh, a total of about 10 to 12 minutes for their presentations. And we will hold questions until the very end of the session. And then we will uh, read questions out loud to the part presenters to answer. Also, if you raise your hands or if you uh, pick a, a hand emoji, uh, you can ask your questions on your own to the presenters. But again, at the very end of whole session, I mean, after our presenters are done with their presentations. And you can ask uh, other technical issues throughout the whole session through chat box. Thank you. So um, we have um, amazing keynote speakers for us today. Uh, which will be starting with um, Bridget, uh, who, is, who is from Goethe Institute. She'll be giving us uh, a keynote speech. She's the head of libraries at the Goethe Institute. And I would like, of course, to welcome Ms. Bridget to give her speech. Bridget, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Damilare and uh, Nilay, for the, for the introduction and uh, for the welcome. This is actually also just a very brief welcome uh, from the Goethe Institute side. First of all, I wanted to say that I'm very happy to see that the group of the emerging voices that formed last year is still so active. I know that it is not easy to keep such a group going. We all have our handful with daily routine and job and to find time and the energy to focus on these additional gatherings and tasks is not always easy. But I'm sure, um, as you have uh, experienced over the last month, it is extremely rewarding. And of course, it's also fun to work with such an international network. Secondly, I found it very interesting and inspiring to read the articles on the Emerging Voices website, where you reflected on the role of the libraries, also in the light of the exchange you had among each other in the last month. For everyone in the audience who has not had the chance to do so, I can only encourage you to have a look at the website. And I'm sure someone, yes, someone has already posted um, the link to the website. So check it out. And last but not least, it is really great uh, that you continue the discussion of the roles of libraries. The pandemic, the rising of fake news, and so many more developments over the last years show once again the importance of libraries. With engaged librarians like you, I see a bright future ahead for the profession. And I'm positive that libra libraries can fulfill their important role in society even better. So I just wanted to say, have fun with the meeting today and thank you to all of you for bringing libraries forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Bridget, for your speech. And we move to the next, our second keynote speaker. Uh, the first one, Mr. Gerard Leitner. 
uh, is the Secretary General of the International Federation of Library Housing and Institutions, CIFLA. Uh, please welcome Mr. Gerard Leitner as he comes to give our uh, keynote speech. Yes, a warm welcome from EFLA's side and thank you to Damilari and Nile for moderating this session and my special thanks are going to Naomi, Elia, Rita, Madarani and Stephen Weiber for all your work in preparing it and of course to you Brigitte for the ongoing support and partnership of the Goethe Institute and I can only say as Secretary General of EFLA that we very much appreciate this partnership. After such an exciting round of discussions last year, it's great to be here again with the emerging international voices and with such a wide range of speakers. It's also necessary, I believe, because there's so much we can gain by crossing experiences, crossing insights, crossing ideas. Of course, we can have a great discussion, which I know is what we will have today, but also we can innovate. At a time where libraries are not only needing to find new ways to deliver traditional services, but also developing completely new services, we need to be able to innovate if we are to be effective and to have an impact on the communities we serve. And of course, to do so at a time when budgets are likely to be under pressure, where once again we will be asked to, to do more with less. I'm fascinated by where we get to with the topic of today's discussion. Because as we see increasingly, the availability of information without restrictions is not its own enough to mean that it is used. This cannot, should not be used as a reason to give up on efforts to promote access to information. We cannot go back to information scarcity, to official censors, to gatekeeping. Equitable access to information, the core mission of libraries, cannot be just another victim of the pandemic. Clearly, however, more is needed. We need guides, coaches, gate openers, trusted institutions with skilled staff, without profit motive, and, without, and with a deep understanding of the information environment. Libraries and librarians, I believe, are so well placed to fulfill this role. So with thanks and anticipation to our speakers, I hope that all our participants here today will go away with new reflections, new insights, and new ideas to try out in your own work. I wish you a very successful session, but I also hope to see many of you at the World Most International Library Congress of the Year, at EFLOS World Library Information Congress in August. And this will be the first time that we are organizing in a total new way as a virtual conference with great speakers from all over the world. And I hope to have you here, that you discuss, that you innovate, that you are with us, with our Congress in August. Let's partner also there. Have a great day and let's do, develop the future together. Many thanks to the organization team. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Leitner, for that wonderful uh, keynote speech. Uh, at this part, Colo Tay, we're gonna move on to introduce to you the Imagine International Voices Fellows, uh, which we're working together for the past uh, couple of months to bring this realization. Uh, now, of, of course, first on the list here that I have on the screen on the screen is Naomi. Uh, Naomi Smith from, from United Kingdom, as your very wonderful colleague. And also Helia uh, from Kochia, and also my colleague uh, Suleiman Madereni uh, from Indonesia, and also Nile uh, from Turkey, and Rita Alexia from Portugal. Uh, and myself, Damilari Oyedeli, I reside currently residing in Kigali, Rwanda. It's been an honor working with uh, this wonderful smart brain to library space to drive progress uh, for the future of the library of librarianship uh, globally. So at this point, I will let my colleague uh, Nile to proceed with the next item on our agenda. Nile, over to you. Thank you. Now we have a very short uh, session of a survey uh, as a part of our webinar. Uh, we'd appreciate it if you would fill the poll uh, that will be provided to you soon. And I'm uh, reading the question out loud. How well have libraries done in preventing fake news during the pandemic? You can pick from very badly to very well. How well have libraries done in preventing fake news during the pandemic? OK. 
give you another 10 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Okay, so most people said um, libraries done okay during the pandemic about preventing fake news. Thank you. All right, let's slowly start with our dear presenters. Uh, now, moving along to our session, please welcome Tina D. Burnett, who will be speaking to us uh, on infodemic management for information professionals. Let me give you some information about her background. Tina Burnett is principal expert in e-health and digital innovations for public health at ECDC. Tina has worked at the intersection of health research, analysis, and policymaking with an emphasis on digital health and health information systems. Most recently, she worked at a World Health Organization on frameworks for assessment and evaluation of artificial intelligence and other digital health technologies in health. As part of the World Health Organization COVID-19 response, she worked in developing and formulating who infodemic uh, response and uh, evidence-based uh, approaches to infodemic management interventions, for which she received a World Health Organization Pathfinder and Innovation Award in 2021. Please, Tina, the time and the screen is yours. Thank you, Nile, so much. Uh, welcome, everyone. And um, I'd like to say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I, I was really impressed by the international representation uh, in the webinar. Um, maybe before I, I, I go through some of the talking points that I prepared, I, I must say, um, um, actually, when I worked last year in WHO COVID-19 response, um, it actually gave me an opportunity to go back to my primary or the first line of education. So I'm actually a trained biomedical informatician. And as you probably, a lot of you know, this uh, is based on information science that uh, is grounded in medical uh, information and information sciences. So it was actually timely to bring all of the experience, not just from the digital technologies, but also from information science. Uh, to, to the problem of infodemic, which is actually a, um, uh, an information issue, not just a communication issue. Um, and before I also start, um, I'd just like to say I completely agree with what Gerald said. Um, really, you know, health is a human right and access to health information is a human right as well. And everything that we do in order to support this and to support people's access to information and also their use of information is really, really important uh, going forward. So that's actually, I'll be speaking a bit from public health perspective today. And there's a lot of other speakers that will take, uh, take other uh, perspectives. So I, I tried to focus maybe a bit more broader on the things that I'd like to share with you or the, th or the thoughts that I'd like to share with you. Um, first, to discuss a little bit about what infodemic is. Uh, WHO <clears throat> uh, Director General, Dr. Tedros, um, already last February declared that we are not only fighting an epidemic, that we're also fighting an infodemic. And some think that the infodemic is only a problem of online misinformation. But experience, both from other outbreaks in the past, uh, has shown us that in times of an epidemic, we experience uncertainty. And this is then accompanied by an overload of information and rumors. And this includes misinformation or plainly just outdated information uh, as the outbreak evolves. And this happens both in online and offline worlds. Uh, and thinking about this is really important because we wouldn't care about the infodemic or health misinformation if it didn't have harmful effects in physical life. So when you combine this search of information with an emergency and uncertainty, it's harder for people to find 
reliable information that could help them make informed decisions to protect their health and their communities. And we've seen real harm over last year from people ingesting methanol in Iran because they thought it would help their bodies get rid of the virus and they went blind. Um, or in many places around the world, people have used herbal remedies or even medications that were unproven to, to treat COVID-19. Uh, so even from outbreaks that took place before COVID-19, in public health, we've learned that the infodemic doesn't only have a direct impact on health or cause confusion. Uh, what's really important here is that it also exacerbates mistrust in science and in health authorities and in public health measures. It even can reduce acceptance of vaccines and treatments. And uh, it also has wider uh, societal impact such as stigma or loosening of, of social cohesion. So, so all of this makes it harder for health authorities to manage the pandemic and also to manage the epidemic risk. Now, what makes the COVID-19 infodemic different is that the pandemic is taking place in a globalized digitized society. And the challenge is really a big one. Uh, just last year, over 200,000 preprints were published online on COVID-19. Uh, the science has evolved and the pandemic response has evolved with it. But rumors and information traveled across borders very quickly. So this has put a strain on not just how to communicate the evolving scientific knowledge, but it has also changed how to respond or how we can respond based on the needs and concerns of communities. And in the end, we want everyone to be empowered to protect themselves and make informed decisions. So the infodemic is a global phenomenon and to reduce its harmful effects, then we need everyone involved. And over the last year, many communities came together. It's not just a job for health authorities, We've seen also a role of media and journalists and the science communities, research journals, civil society, fact checkers and, and, and others. And this brings me to two reflections today. Um, the first one is that um, I see libraries as trusted community places that connect people. Uh, I think the physical or digital library spaces have not yet received enough recognition for the impacts that they're making in the communities and therefore the impacts they can make to promote access to information and to promote infodemic resilience. Um, libraries can do so many things, uh, educate and build literacy and be trusted places for people to get vaccinated or receive other health or social services. So uh, I know, for example, that in the US, they're already being used to help people find jobs and early childhood education and help newcomers learn English. Uh, why is this important? Uh, because when, when people that you trust share misinformation, this adds credibility to it. And, and we let our guard down around family and friends and colleagues. So, you know, you see this often COVID-19 outbreaks occur in clusters because people let their guard down. So in the same way that we practice uh, hand and cough hygiene, we should be practicing information hygiene. And I think libraries are trusted spaces for finding health information, but also for discussing this information hygiene with individual people and with communities. And the second thought I wanted to share with you today is also um, on the importance of the library sciences professionals uh, in the way science is done, curated, and communicated. Um, we've seen that the pandemic has eroded public trust in experts. And this is partly because COVID-19 is a fast moving area in which understanding is constantly changing. And scientists have historically not had to explain to the public how it all works or why people change their minds with new evidence. 
Now, this process is visible to all and an abundance of new communication channels and self-appointed experts are creating confusion around what information is real and what can be trusted. So we all should be mindful of our responsibility to science and evidence, but also to our accountability to the public um, on the way science and scientific process are communicated and explained. The scientific community and research journals need to do their part in how, for example, preprints are explained and how limitations of studies are explained. Uh, there have been calls for more involvement of science communicators, but I see also a special role for librarians, uh, those with specialist backgrounds or those who work in, in settings like schools or medical libraries who can also offer infodemic management resources appropriate to their audiences. And promoting open science and good practices for evidence appraiser are really critical going forward. So just in conclusion, you know, um, I really think poor information nowadays is responsible for morbidity and mortality from diseases in the world. And in the past, scientists didn't have incentives to promote the public understanding or to learn how to communicate and promote science other than through peer reviewed publications. And we need to change that. The pandemic has shown that uh, we need to change this, especially to maintain trust in science. And ultimately across all of the society, we all face the same challenge, how to communicate to, uh, how to convince others to believe something that the, that emotionally they don't want to believe. So in this sense, I see libraries and librarians as trusted spaces and a trusted profession that are present in communities. And just like community health workers, they can be a major ally and partner. You can be a major ally and partner in building longer term resilience to the infodemic and also to help communicate science. So thank you very much. This was some reflections going forward, and I'm really excited to hear the discussion and, and all of the other speakers. Thank you, Tina, for your great presentation and also for sticking with the time limit. You're great. Um, okay, so next, Damlari, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Alini, and thank you very much, uh, Tina, for that wonderful uh, presentation. I, I caught something that we've been accountable to the public about this meeting that we shared today, which is highly essential. So as we move on to the next speaker, uh, which is in a, uh, a young person like myself also, uh, our next speaker is Victor Ejechi from Statisense. Uh, Victor has invested a lot of his time in developing himself in the knowledge industry as a professional librarian in Nigeria, uh, where he has been able to mentor a lot of young librarians in the library space uh, across Africa, and as a columnist, where he has also been able to write a lot of articles articles uh, in most national newspapers in Nigeria and as a data enthusiast uh, of which he currently works with one of the best uh, data management and consulting companies in Nigeria called or Statisense uh, in the capacity of the media and communications lead. Uh, Victor, you have the floor to go ahead with your presentation. Well, uh, thank you so much, Dami, for that short uh, info. It's good to be here. I, I don't know if it's possible for me to share my screen. Is it possible? Yeah, sure. Okay, uh, thank you. Okay, um, let me start from the beginning. Okay, uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's really an honor to be here. And I'm, I'm excited. Uh, today, I will be talking on the topic advocating librarians in handling myths and disinformation uh, during the pandemic. And as Damilaya has said earlier, on, my name is um, Victor uh, Ejechi. Now, uh, the, the, the truth is, we need to first of all ask ourselves why are we having this conversation? It's important that we know why we are having this conversation. Why did this? Uh, why did you all decide to put up uh, this conversation at this point in time? Um, 
and because I'm a data person and I love I love about talking about data and talking about um, I'm a data enthusiast, just like that Larry like said. So according to um, Statista, um, the word active internet user as at um, as at January is 4.66 billion. In other words, in the in the whole wild world, we have about 4.66 billion people that are active internet users. So that is about 59.5% of the global population. So misinformation, fake news reports, and disinformation should concern every one of us, even as librarians. Also, of the total uh, of the total uh, of the total of what I showed you earlier on in my slide, we have about 92.6% that can access the internet using their mobile devices. So that is about 4.32 billion people. So in other words, people are no longer waiting to go to the library to access materials. They are literally having access to information on their mobile devices, on the go, on the go. So in other words, we should be careful, we should be concerned about how information is being disseminated and how information is being shared on, on online. Now, um, I'm a media person. Um, I'm also a senior reporter with Cable newspaper here in Nigeria, and uh, a part uh, that I did not see. And it's interesting that in the media house or in the news world, or in the, uh, the fact checking world, there's a saying that we normally say to our colleagues that if your mother says she loves you, check it out. Like you need to confirm. If your mother or your father say they love you, you need to check them out. Like, do you really love me? Don't just accept what they said. Now, this just go back to what Tina said earlier on when she was talking about the information hygiene. Now, it's so scary. It's really, really funny that people you trust send you an information. How can you even doubt it? If your mother, for instance, should tell you that there's a plane crash somewhere, you will just start disseminating information to your friends and family without even confirming if there's really a plane crash because you trust the person sending it. Let me even tell you the shocking one that happens mostly in Nigeria, where I come from. Uh, if your lecturer should send you an information, you are kind of like, this is my lecturer. It's correct. Let me share to everyone. And it's even more bad and more even funny that imagine a librarian sending you an information. It means that so you, you feel like that information is correct. Let me go share. So in other words, I'm saying this to say that uh, I, I am a person, I, I, I love social media so much. And I used to say that for every social media platform you belong to, you need a librarian on that particular platform. And the job of the librarian on that platform is to check, meet whatever is coming out on that platform. But these days it's funny that even the librarians cannot even verify the information that they're even sending to people. So it's kind of making it questionable. Because I have built a brand uh, over the years that if I put that information online, people don't necessarily need to go check it out again. They felt like whatever Victor is putting out is correct. But in regardless of who is sending out any information, we should double check whatever we disseminate to the public. Now, this brings me down to the word called um, um, mis and disinformation. It's quite interesting because, um, and then there's a word called fake news. Um, I, I personally believe there's nothing like fake news. I personally don't believe there's anything like fake, fake news. It has to be either misinformation or disinformation. So the word you call fake news is just, uh, Donald Trump just made it popular. Because when Donald Trump is not in alignment with what uh, CNN is saying, it's fake news. When CNN supports him, it's correct news, you understand? So that's actually where the word fake news started coming. It became more popular, you know, but to be fair with uh, to librarians uh, in Africa, I think where most librarians fall short in is the, the part of misinformation. In the sense that misinformation means an information that is not, I, I'm trying to make it simple as possible. You understand? Misinformation is just about unintentional. It's about intention when you check these two things. And we are all, see, listen, let me tell you, we are all victim of this. We have all done this at one point in time. At one point in time, you understand? So let me give you a, a practical example. I told Damilari that my birthday is starting by 4 p.m. But Damilari told Tina that my birthday is starting by 5 p.m. What has Damilari done? He has misinformed Tina. He, he, he did not 
didn't do it intentionally. It's just that he did not get the information correctly. So he just decided to share. So me, uh, what Tina had now is that uh, Tina don't have, uh, she obviously did not have the correct information. But in the part of the world where I come from and what I believe, good intention is not good enough. Just having a good intention is not enough. So you can go to jail, but we understand that, oh, the information you passed was not intentionally, you don't mean it, but you have to still go to jail for what you posted. You understand? And I think this is where most Liberian for sure, though. everybody is just posting information they believe is correct. Now, why this information is uh, an intentional act? So people do it maybe for propaganda sake and other things that uh, where you just intentionally propagate or uh, disseminate information that you know is wrong. You understand? But there is no excuse for this two parts. We must definitely be able to check whatever we put out. Yeah. So um, my next slide also confirmed what I was saying to say that the reason why we share things online, there is a reason why we come online and decide to push an information. There's what they call confirmation bias. Each day we are looking at information, see, because we need to, to deal with fake news or to deal with misinformation and disinformation, we must understand the place of confirmation bias. We all have a bias and our ability to own our biases is very key. We shouldn't deny it, we shouldn't push it. Let me give you a practical example. Uh, if you're a Christian, you believe Jesus is Lord. That is why you believe Jesus is Lord. You have a bias because you're a Christian. When you see an accident on the road that repeats that Jesus is Lord, you want to disseminate that information. You want to share, to confirm what you already believe. That is confirmation bias. So, but your ability to own this as even a librarian is very key because we are looking for what to, we are looking for information to support whatever we already believe. That is what confirmation bias is all about. But it's not good enough. We should still go ahead to check everything that we see online. Now quickly, let me just try to round up. There are things to check out for as librarians, things to check out for. You have to check out for unusual URL, the site name, before you disseminate information. The social media profile, are they legitimate? Are there, is the information site good? Now you also need to check out the mission and the purpose and the contact information of the website you want to share, you understand? Determine the type, among other things. Consider an authority in the field before you disseminate such information. What is the web saying about it? Do you even take time to go and check out this thing before you even share, you understand? And, and uh, I think that's just basically, then you trade off that, uh, rather than relying on the source where you first saw the information, this part is very important. Rather than relying on where you first saw the information, can you take extra time to go and check all that means their houses to see if they're actually posting what you are about to share? Now, uh, so the trusted information to the top of the part, now, if the information seems true but credible, but mainstream people have not reported it, you need to dig deeper. I've seen this happen during the COVID-19 era. We saw a particular news uh, uh, a paper posted something. I saw it first, and I, I wasn't so sure. So I called my media people, like, this report is being published by some person. Can we double check it? So we double check. Even when we double check, we did not see some anything to confirm what the guy posted or what they posted. But we just hold on because we cannot confirm what we, we did not know. Now, okay, use for checking science. So let me just introduce this particular because uh, you have to use scientific way to check it. I just want to introduce this, what they call a fact check, uh, fact check explorer by Google. It's, very, it's an amazing site. Just go to your Google browser, just go to a fact check explorer. Very amazing. Just whenever you are in doubt as a librarian, whenever you're in doubt of whatever information you're about to put it, go to that particular website and click the information and you will see if it has been fact checked before and if it is wrong. And I think that it is very important to fact check everything. And remember, if I say I love you, you still need to confirm it. Like if I say I love you, you know I love you too. But if I say I love you, you need to go and check it again if I really, really love you. You understand? So that is actually where fact checking comes in. So thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you very much, Victor, for sharing relatable uh, examples to uh, that addresses your topic. Uh, it's quite interesting to hear from you and giving us insight uh into how we can uh work it, how we can work together to drive uh how we can work together to to stop this spread of fake news uh disinformation and misinformation as library professionals uh at this point in time i'm gonna call on my colleague Mille to proceed uh with the next speaker we have for today Mille, over to you thank you thank you thank you victor for your great uh, and interesting um presentation i definitely learned my lesson and i'll go check with my mom so let's move on. Our third speaker is uh, Feda Klenovic from the University of Sarajevo. 
Let me give you some information about his background. He's a communications and information expert with several projects in data analytics and visualization. Consulting government uh, NGOs and media in use of technology and data for data visualization and use of data in startups. He works on knowledge management, knowledge sharing and information management. He is working with startups in Bosnia and Herzegovina on how to plan and improve their business ideas. He's always on a lookout for open source alternatives that can improve an exchange of data and information to keep everyone informed. He's also teaching information systems, web design and information architecture and internet culture. Please Feda, and the time in the screen is yours. Thank you. Uh... When I hear that introduction, I, <laughs> I sometimes doubt that's me, but, uh, <laughs> but I truly try to, to do uh, a lot of these things and, and uh, also uh, to kind of uh, work on my teaching and transfer of knowledge. Um, as you said, I'm uh, part of the University of Sarajevo, which is my, my main uh, uh, job uh, at the Chair of Information Science, which used to be actually a Chair of Library Science uh, uh, up until uh, last year, we kind of changed our name when the uh, the pandemic uh, started a bit earlier. Uh, and I'm here uh, to talk about the uh, importance of open access during the pandemic, uh, which kind of goes into uh, uh, my biography and, and saying that uh, everything open is, is important. Um, I will just also emphasize as part of my, my kind of uh, identity more than a, a profession that I'm a librarian without a library. I used to be a librarian, uh, a particularly a military librarian, and uh, oddly enough, the openness actually came from, from, from this work, apart from being a, a librarian at the Human Rights Center. Uh, because, like I said, oddly enough, uh, uh, international military community is, is very open in, in, in sharing their sources and knowledge, uh, uh, particularly when it comes to, to peacekeeping and, and other operations. Um, but um, I will start with some data, of course, and uh, I will mention that, sorry, uh, that um, our internet, internet penetration is, is, let's say, somewhere uh, uh, low. Uh, uh, compared to the population of 3.5 million, we have uh, some statistics say 70% uh, of, of, of uh, um, <clears throat> homes have internet access, but basically 90% uh, of, of them have some form of social media connectors, and it goes up in, in uh, uh, I would say, 100% almost uh, when, when we come to the younger population, which means that this is, this is something that uh, we all have to deal with. Uh, but on the other side, the libraries are not always well connected in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina in terms of social media. Uh, however, in uh, what I would say that uh, is important for, for me as, as a librarian and as, a, as an educator, uh, particularly in, in time of, of pandemic, is this uh, quote from the Atlas of New Librarianship by, by David Lankes, uh, uh, which is basically the, the starting kind of a, um, imperative for us, which is that uh, our mission uh, as librarians, and I always focus on people, on librarians more than libraries, because uh, as, as a topic, because because that's uh, who, who, who the people are and, and who create change, uh, is to improve society through faci facilitating knowledge creation in their communities uh, that they serve. Uh, and it is, this is always kind of a, a, a a main lesson that we're trying to to transfer to our students uh, as well at the university, uh, but not only to students, but anyone that we're kind of serving as part of our community, uh, uh, saying that we're we're in a mission to improve society. Uh, and uh, David Blank is kind of uh, just recently uh, uh, made a point in one of his uh, presentations saying that if librarians wish a better world, they have to make it better, not wait for it uh, to happen. Uh, and uh, as, a, as a Department of Information Science and uh, our students as well, uh, whether they're still active uh, students or, or they, they graduated from, from uh, different uh, levels of their, of their education, are uh, taking this, um, this role seriously. Uh, I always also emphasize that, particularly in the Balkans and Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, age of disinformation has lasted 
uh, way longer than than the uh, pandemic, uh, uh, and it started in the '90s, uh, and we're still struggling with with this uh, this kind of a, a problem. Uh, but uh, now uh, it turned into a pan uh, infodemic, uh, as as it was mentioned already, uh, and this this caused a lot of uh, issues for for everyone. Uh, particularly the university librarians who who had to also serve the community uh, at the university, but try to also help the, the wider community to um, uh, kind of um, break the the the, the walls of of uh, prevent uh, information access. So how can librarians facilitate? Uh, I would say that the answer is, and which is a focus of my study, is embedded librarians, which which is a is a term that comes from a medical librarians uh, um, branch. But uh, I think this is this is where we we uh, uh, excel. We are always embedded. We go outside of the libraries uh, and we embed ourselves in different communities, trying to to help them. And I'll show you some examples how how we uh, do it. Uh, and this truly means everywhere. So uh, even in the streets, uh, in uh, different movements, protests at the at the uh, 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 for for different minorities and their causes, uh, or just just being at the bank and and helping someone to to figure out how to use a, a, a their their bank card or something. Um, However, this is the problem, and uh, regardless of, of uh, the fact that most of the publishers and uh, uh, these five publishers uh, included have opened their uh, uh, access to the research on, on, on uh, COVID-19, uh, most of the research is still locked away somewhere, even though we all kind of paid for it. And uh, we and I personally, I can't speak for, for everyone else at the uh, university, but uh, the, the librarians community mostly believe in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina that this is really not, not uh, the solution because open access is truly a human rights issue. Uh, and a uh, pandemic has shown this uh, more than, more than, if nothing else has shown uh, before the pandemic uh, has shown this uh, particularly. Uh, the thing is that researchers want to share their work. Uh, they they want to to make it uh, known to uh, to everyone, uh, and um, I believe uh, that that in in Bosnia and Herzegovina that's the same case. But they don't know how to, which which is sometimes the case, particularly in humanities, uh, and uh, they are prevented to do that. Uh, so even if they want to share it, they they can't share it for for different reasons. Uh, mostly because the knowledge infrastructure prevents them. Now, I will not, not go into the knowledge infrastructure story, but it's about the sources, technologies, policies, and language. And policies is something that uh, uh, that kind of is, is at the center of, of this story. Uh, but the language is something that I would also like to talk to, uh, talk about because it is uh, uh, just everything's focused on English language. If we see the example at the, the question of, of answers on the sources of, of on COVID-19, I would say that uh, most of them are in English language and uh, uh, very few are in uh, other languages. Um, so the, uh, I, what we do right now is as librarians, as the librarian, the library community in at the university is we're trying to help them to navigate these issues through, through uh, kind of going to the gray area of open access. Uh, uh, but sometimes some of the librarians can also be obstacles because of their, their uh, lack of their knowledge. So we also have to educate uh, our peers in, in, in sense of uh, not to be too rigid in viewing some of the rules and regulations that are kind of imposed on us uh, instead of uh, uh, making us the part of the solution. Uh, so uh, I'll just give you a couple of examples of the uh, open access at the University of Sarajevo uh, that has helped us to kind of uh, overcome the, uh, the, the physical barriers that, that were imposed by the, by the pandemic. Uh, and Truly, librarians were from the beginning the part of the solution uh, to the information act, lack of information access for, for our students, uh, particularly because uh, most of the university libraries uh, do not 
have the resources to pay expensive fees for for accessing some of the, the major databases, even though we do have uh, uh, enough uh, access to to electronic resources. But again, I'm emphasizing the language issue, which is also a, a great issue at the um, in studying information science at the uh, University of Sarajevo, because most of the the contemporary uh, uh, sources are in in other languages and not in uh, South Slavic languages uh, that, that are basically our, our mother tongue, is our mother tongue. Um, so for me, the solution has always been uh, openness. Uh, and when I say open, it's about open source uh, in terms of software, open data, uh, and open knowledge. Uh, and, and sharing all of this regardless of the, frankly, consequences. Um, so I'll mention some of the, 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 the solutions that we have implemented as the community in different library, libraries that were not able to purchase expensive uh, library information systems. So we're uh, one, of the, one of the great software coming from Indonesia uh, uh, is, is a really good solution. Uh, and we've empowered different communities to use the, the, this, uh, this open source software for um, to serve their communities uh, in a sense uh, and of course Omeka is as a digital library uh, software where, where we're really focused on um, um, doing doing this work with our students uh, as an introductory work to explain them why open access is important. Uh, we've introduced media and information literacy uh, as a subject not only in uh, in our department but also at the political uh, faculty of political science which kind of uh, helps us to do to access this problem from from different perspectives and show our students, for instance, that uh, information science and library work is really uh, a, a society a work for better, bettering the society, uh, and it is deeply political. Uh, we've opened uh, uh, we've installed the open journal system uh, which is also an open soft uh, open source software and we're experimenting with it right now, but we're trying to change the policies, which is which is quite important. And we're right now in the midst of, of trying to convince the government to, to change some of the policies. We're opening the books, the educational resources, uh, but most of all, we're hacktivists. Uh, and uh, even though this is, this is not a, a, a word that comes always uh, with the librarians, I would say we are because we, we are uh, also committed to liberating educational resources for, for uh, our uh, communities so they can be served better uh, and kind of uh, take on the, 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 the gray areas of dangers that, that go with the pandemic, uh, with the infodemic, uh, but we are committed uh, to work with them, to uh, uh, inform them and be, uh, particularly for our students to be hacktivists on social media and be committed to, to their mission of librarians, uh, not only as a profession, but as an identity where they will always try to prevent someone else spreading the misinformation. And so far we have uh, succeeded with that. Uh, we're also assisting media in the Balkans to improve their technological knowledge infrastructure so, so they can actually use better, uh, better technology to open technology to, to inform uh, their communities. Uh, we have worked with different organizations that are fact-checking to, to, uh, uh, to show them how our students with their knowledge and abilities can, can become uh, uh, fact-checkers as well. And some of them uh, uh, have, have been doing that for, for a year. Uh, but also uh, they, they do different uh, work as information experts to prevent the infodemic. And most of the uh, university infrastructure is committed uh, to be active on the social media and try to raise the, uh, the questions, the, the tough questions, not only with the communities, but, but with those who are responsible for uh, sharing uh, relevant sources and are not doing so. And we're trying to help them to, to uh, prevent to kind of be better in this. So thank you and I, I'm handing over the floor, sorry. Thank you, Feda. 
Now uh, for our next uh, speaker, please, Damlara, it's your floor. Yeah, thank you very much, Nuri, for that. Thank you very much, Peda, for your presentation. Uh, before I invite our next speakers to come on board, so please kindly feel free to share thoughts and insights in this conversation on your social media platform with the hashtag Imagine National Voices, okay? So our next speaker for today uh, is Professor Yasa Tonta uh, from the Department of Information Management at Assetep University. Uh, a brief about Mr. Uh, Dr. Professor uh, Tonta. He's a professor in the Department of Information Management of, of Assetep University in, in Ankara, Turkey. His areas of teaching and research are information retrieval, uh, information system design, bibliometrics, network information services, open access and cultural heritage. He served in the past as a founding director of the Turkish Academic Network and Information Center, and as the chair of the Department of Information Management of the Assetep University. He received uh, his graduate degrees in library and information studies from the University of California in, at Berkeley, uh, University of Wales, and um, Assetep University. So uh, for more details about about him, uh, we're gonna show you a link to, to, to get to know more about uh, Professor Yasatunta. So Yasatunta, please come over. It's time to uh, get your presentation, sir. Thank you. Thank you for this introduction. And um, thank you also for the invitation for this um, a very timely event. Um, before I switch to uh, my uh, topic, uh, the OA developments in Turkey, I would like to just uh, share uh, uh, a few things about um, open access and uh, infodemics. Whenever um, I see open access uh, used uh, together with another uh, thing like uh, predatory journals or plagiarism or whatever, I sort of get a little bit uneasy because um, at least some people tend to think that um, open access causes whatever you uh, say after the end, whether it is predatory journals or, or whatever. Um, of course, the idea is not uh, to actually uh, say this uh, when it comes to open access and infodemics, but uh, nevertheless, um, um, one uh, can think about um, and compare the scarcity of information as opposed to the overabundance of information in the digital age. And uh, uh, infodemics um, is defined as um, uh, both, um, you know, uh, inaccurate and accurate information. However, uh, we cannot say that uh, this is the uh, open access movement's uh, fault, actually, uh, because it also helps us to um, solve our problems um, uh, much better, be it on COVID-19 or whatever. For instance, uh, from the open access uh, point of view, uh, I think um, uh, one of the most important um, um, contribution to the uh, current uh, COVID-19 uh, um, saga, one would say, is that open access enables us to uh, actually verify the uh, fake uh, information very quickly. The first speaker talked about, um, you know, hundred thousands of uh, papers getting published um, about COVID-19. But uh, I should also uh, uh, just um, tell you that uh, some of those articles uh, were actually retracted um, in less than a week, thanks to the transparency and uh, uh, ability to verify uh, that information if it is uh, not uh, correct. So uh, we should also think about that. And I think we should also think about the um, human nature. Um, there is a saying that, um, a lie can uh, run around the world before uh, truth uh, has got its boots on. Um, unfortunately, uh, we as human beings are more inclined to believe uh, fake news about other people or in uh, overall about uh, the um, events that are not uh, positive. So uh, we have to keep that in mind as well when we study um, um, open access infodemics and its effect on libraries. 
Uh, recently, I uh, was scanning a, a 130 page um, uh, report, which included uh, 250 recommendations um, uh, on how to actually combat um, infodemics. And there wasn't even a single mention of libraries or memory institutions as partners uh, in this uh, uh, camp, uh, so to speak, uh, against um, uh, infodemics. Uh, however, uh, it's very crucial, of course, uh, from the um, uh, liber libraries and librarians perspective to actually take a look at this and um, um, see this as an opportunity. I think why they didn't even mention libraries once could be because of, um, you know, the uh, verification of um, information distributed through the social media. I mean, you can't really go and check the library if something is um, correct or not. However, libraries can actually teach people how to actually um, prevent this uh, fake information being distributed. IFLA has already developed an eight step um, uh, guidelines to uh, combat uh, infodemics as uh, I'm sure uh, participants already know. But uh, in addition to that, I think um, uh, libraries can also um, teach their users as to how to approach each and every um, piece of information um, as the previous um, or uh, Victor said, um, uh, you know, you have to sort of be um, skeptical about uh, what you see uh, and uh, you shouldn't let uh, the um, news items um, distributed very uh, quickly. Again, uh, I should uh, also point out or sort of um, a uh, weak point as human beings that uh, somehow um, uh, we tend to share bad news uh, much faster than the uh, good news, I'm afraid. Um, I think that's um, uh, what I would say uh, about the overall OA uh, and uh, infodemics and uh, libraries role. Let me briefly um, give a sense of the overall uh, open access um, um, scenery uh, in Turkey. Uh, I know the title is very encompassing. It says um, open access practices in Turkey and world uh, uh, in the past, uh, present and the future, but there is no way one can actually do this in uh, 10 minutes. Uh, however, let me uh, just uh, point out a few things about the overall uh, scenery uh, first. As we all know, uh, open access actually um, um, came into being uh, before even the World Wide Web uh, was around in uh, early 90s. Uh, Stefan Harnett uh, talked about um, um, uh, scholarly skywriting, uh, post Gutenberg galaxy, and how electronic publishing enabled uh, us to actually uh, process information. Uh, differently, and uh, he came up with this uh, what's called subversive proposal, uh, suggesting that uh, it's so easy in the uh, electronic environment to actually um, so, um, store your um, articles uh, on an FTP server and then uh, share this with the world very easily. So um, in those days, of course, we didn't even have a World Wide Web. Uh, and we didn't even have the term open access. Instead, uh, public, public access was the preferred um, uh, term then. Uh, there was even a um, uh, PAX review, public access computer systems review that uh, started uh, uh, publishing in 1990, I suppose. So anyhow, um, later on we um, saw the um, 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 Budapest Open Access Initiative in the early 2000s. Uh, this is actually the time um, the open access uh, was also um, uh, considered in Turkey, at least in the preliminary stages, um, because um, uh, the um, 
uh, BOAE, uh, Budapest Open Access Initiative, etc., um, heightened the awareness about the open access and uh, Stefan Harnad's uh, subversive proposal as well. In the 2000s, early 2000s, uh, in Turkey, we um, had um, Anatolian Libraries Consortium, which uh, set up a working group um, on open access and institutional repositories. Uh, to actually uh, increase this awareness uh, in the national level as well. And um, um, in, um, in the uh, 2000s, early 2000s, um, Turkey participated in EU supported uh, open access projects uh, like um, OpenAir, like uh, Medoenet, like um, uh, Pastor for OA. Some are um, about the open access policy development, others are to actually uh, become a part of the Mediterranean uh, open access uh, community, so to speak. So uh, at the same time, um, the uh, first uh, open access um, uh, workshop uh, was organized in 2012 for the first uh, research data management workshop um, organized in, uh, uh, in a couple of years later. In fact, just yesterday and today, we had a two day full uh, conference on national uh, research data um, uh, symposium just ended before uh, this event. Uh, so um, at least for the last 10 years, um, the applications, the number of applications uh, has increased tremendously. Just a few uh, things, um, for instance, um, uh, Turkish Scientific and Technological uh, Research Council right now um, uh, harvests the um, publications um, uh, from the uh, institutional repositories um, around Turkey. We have about 200 universities, 158 of them listed already in the open door and some 150 of them uh, have their um, um, policies listed in the um, uh, ROAR, um, so to speak. But in addition to that, um, um, Turkish uh, Scientific and Technological Research Center is also the hub for the uh, research data uh, as well. So um, they have what's called aperta ap to uh, store research data. And uh, uh, as the uh, hosting institution, um, it also uh, helps um, or rather hosts some uh, 2000 journals, academic journals published uh, in Turkey. So they are all open access uh, and uh, indexed in uh, Zenodo and, and some uh, in other um, um, platforms. So this is, uh, uh, this, this, this is uh, great because we have uh, more than 300,000 uh, uh, papers uh, that can be accessed through uh, Google Scholar, Zenodo, etc. In addition, we have uh, more than uh, 500,000 um, thesis and dissertations um, uh, accessible online as well, um, uh, even though um, um, uh, not all of them um, are um, or can be discovered very easily. So um, all in all, I would say that uh, within the last uh, 10 years and especially within the last couple of years, first on uh, open access to publications and then to open access to data uh, has become uh, a very uh, vibrant area in the library and information science community. And uh, we have been trying to uh, sort of uh, follow the uh, developments and reflect this in our own organizations um, as well. So um, I think uh, um, the future when it comes to open science uh, and uh, infodemics, uh, et cetera, uh, the same um, tools that we use in open access uh, to research data, to publications would also uh, help us uh, to fight against uh, infodemics as well as to um, uh, become the uh, part of the overall open science community thanks to the developments within the last uh, 30 years. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Yasa, for your presentation. Uh, before I call on my colleagues to push the next speaker, 
I want to, we have, I know, I know you have questions to ask in the course of this presentation. Please uh, use the Q&A to drop your questions. And after the presentation for today, we'll attend to all your questions accordingly. So um, Mile, you can go ahead now. Uh, thank you, Professor Tonta, for this uh, interesting and informing uh, presentation. Last but not least, our final speaker is Dr. Dasapta Arvin Ravan from uh, RIN Archive, uh, Good Science Indonesia, and Bandung Institute of Technology in Indonesia. Dr. Dasapta Arvin Ravan is Assistant Professor in Hydrogeology. He's working as an active researcher and lecturer at the Faculty of Earth Sciences and Technology, Institute Technology Bandung. He focuses his research on translating hydrochemical data to understand the underlying hydrogeological system. He's also actively participating in promoting the open science movement to Indonesia's research ecosystem. Various national and international talks have been delivered by him to raise the awareness of freedom in research and publishing. Please, Mr. Arvin, the time on the screen is yours. Uh, good night, everyone. My name is Dasapta. I'm speaking from Indonesia, Bandung. Now is 9 p.m. here. So I'm uh, just going to show this um, sketch note um, and the link to the narrative. I has uh, uh, I shared the, the link in the chat. So uh, let's start with uh, the spread of knowledge is marked by the changing global literacy from uh, writing on the walls in the pyramid and stone tablets into letters on palm leaves. Right? And, then, uh, and then people are looking, were looking for the fastest way to publish. And then there's this uh, Gutenberg machine. And, and then centuries later, we have this um, desktop publishing, right? That revolutionized the uh, the publishing uh, complexity, and then suddenly uh, visibility become important. Scientific documents must be easily found, read, and then ultimately it could be cited. Instead of libraries, search engines such as Yahoo and then now it's Google were the go-to place. Uh, to find information uh, due to its uh, practicality. Uh, when a document is online, uh, then the binary crawlers will find it and publish it on Google search results. Furthermore, text mining becomes uh, essential. Online information must be able to be captured, processed, and analyzed. The goal is to demolish the, uh, demolish the physical and virtual walls. And then uh, in the next era, on the other hand, the dissemination of scientific information doesn't follow such uh, accessible road. Uh, academics are bounded by the narrow publication path set as standard by most of the global north. Instead of being critical, the global south academics accepted it without further arguments. They even promoted it uh, as a symbol of prestige. Open access has been moved from the community domain to commercial domain, putting many left behind. With existing standards brought by the commercial entities, most knowledge seems to flow from the north to the south. However, based on an open scientific database, the Global South Academics produce more papers combined, which are not included in the calculations, at least in the, in the, in the case of earth science, my field. And then most of the Global South academics would pursue the standards for the incentives, neglecting their leading role in educating society. The culture of critical thinking, which the public should, have, should also have, is not conveyed. As a result, people will believe more fake news and immediately spread it widely through their communication networks. Hence, in my mind, let us meet in the middle ground. It's Central Park. Uh, if you watch uh, Friends series, you would know the Central Park. <laughs> okay. 
So we need to carry the spirit of democratic, democratizing knowledge. And then scientific standards are not determined by the commercial entities, but by the community itself. And then as a call out, I would say that scientists should broadly communicate their research firsthand. And then open science is way forward to do it. Infodemic is inevitable. Hence, we need to develop screening skills. So I summarize that. <laughs> that narrative into this one page uh, uh, visual notes. Uh, I hope everyone uh, can understand my uh, talk and also enjoy the drawing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Irwan, for your great speech. Damar? Yeah, thank you very much uh, to our speakers for the wonderful sp uh, presentation we've heard from you today. Uh, at this point, uh, we're going to move on to take your questions. But before then, uh, to our participants, please drop your questions in the Q&A. Uh, of course, we'll be able to respond to, to your questions. Uh, before we, we, we go to the participants' questions, uh, we'll have a question here uh, for, our pan for our speakers, uh, which is, uh, what worries you most and what are your hopes about libraries handling the fake news fake news, especially infodemic. I repeat myself again on the question that we have for you, our speakers. Uh, what worries you the most? And what are your hopes about libraries handling the fake news, especially infodemic? Um, so, um, Tina, you can go ahead with this question. Sure. That's a good question. Um, what worries me most? I think uh, perhaps that in, in current um, rush of discussions uh, in, 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 in the public and also you know, with policymakers in general, that we tend to right now focus a lot on misinformation. And while it does have a huge, uh, it can have a huge impact on, on wider, the way that, that our democracies work, the way that our public dialogue works, um, and also how we are able to communicate. My concern, you know, having been analyzing and, and following the infodemic uh, over the last year, is that actually, while misinformation is an issue, uh, online it, it goes and it moves through con algorithmic contract pro pro promotion, etc. So it sort of doesn't always land and it doesn't always translate into risk behavior or uh, 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 or behavior that, that harms us. It's really the whole information ecosystem that we need to be concerned about. And uh, that will take a long time, you know, people are advocating about transparency and accountability of, of different actors, etc., in the information ecosystem. Uh, but I think uh, I would agree with, with several previous speakers that we need to really focus on empowering communities and individuals, meaning that we need to work on information media literacy and resilience. So we need to give back the agency for action to people and communities. And as I said at the beginning, really, um, I think uh, uh, libraries in all contexts have a huge role to play, central role to play in this, because this is a societal issue. And libraries are spaces where uh, everyone's welcome to uh, not just get access to information, but also discuss it and learn more skills. And uh, this is really key. So if we're trying to imagine a healthy information ecosystem, um, that's where I see the role. Uh, and that's what uh, uh, where I want to partner up um, uh, further with the library and information community. Thank you very much, uh, Tina, for that insight. Victor Ujishi, what's your take on this particular question? Yeah, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, Tina has actually hit the, uh, um, uh, the nail on the head. Um, what scared me most um, with the way information is, is um, information every day is being created, whether you like it or not, it's not going to stop for any reason. 
So uh, because of that, I think that we need to focus more on information literacy skill. Librarians need to make this as one of their top priorities. You need to train people because you can't totally fight it by yourself. And, and also understand that your job as a librarian does not just end in the four walls of your library. You have gone be, be, be without walls. So you need to, uh, the librarians in today's world needs to be upright and learn new skills, learn fact checking skills themselves. I feel like librarians should be fact checkers, personally. I feel, I feel that we should leave, we should leave, uh, the uh, fact checking should be part of, because we should, be, we should be dynamic to move with the trend. So uh, what is happening to, in today's world is that information is gradually every day pumping into the, uh, to the internet. So librarians are supposed to sit up, teach people information literacy skills. And first of all, them themselves need to learn the information literacy skills and learn the necessary tools that can fight and combat uh, uh, fake news. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Victor. We have an interesting question from the former participants. Uh, uh, Dr. Erwin, I want you to address this question. It says, how can libraries and librarians uh, deal with copyright issues during this pandemic? Hmm. Ah, okay. Uh, copyright issue is always the problem, but uh, in, in my case, uh, we should uh, use an open license for each document published, uh, um, published online. And then we should rely on the, the honesty of people, right? So with this, with the, uh, with the search engine that available now, we actually we could detect if someone has copied my work without my permission or without uh, citing. We, sorry, I, I should uh, clarify not without my permission, but without citing the sources. So I think with the available tools, we could detect uh, the, the, the plagiarism if it's, if it's uh, conducted. So copyright issue should not be a problem as long as we, we declare or all the terms and condition in, in uh, research, uh, especially when it uh, relates to several uh, counterparts. Yeah, we should use open license such as Creative Commons license, I think. Yeah. yeah thank, thank you very much for, for that. Uh, Feda, do you have a comment on this? Um, yeah, I agree that, that the open licenses mm -hmm. are the way to go, uh, but also that's, that, that takes time to some extent. So, so if we, we need to educate the uh, community about it, but the problem with open licenses in, uh, in small countries like ours, like Bosnia and Herzegovina, is that they need to be um, kind of part of a policy of financing research. Right now, for instance, there's a tendency to uh, 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 kind of give limited research resources uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina from the public uh, sources to, to those researchers who have uh, a Q impact and, and stuff like that, which, which is really hard to achieve in, in, in some sciences, <clears throat> particularly, for instance, in humanities, in archaeology, in sociology, uh, that deals with local issues that are not interesting for, for a wider community, but should be addressed uh, in, in terms of the Balkan or, or at least the country. Uh, and, and you can't achieve your, your impact that way. Uh, and this discourages open licensing. What we're trying to do is to kind of, at least at the university level, open up the dialogue uh, as, as a uh, knowledge source on, on open licensing and explain why this is important uh, for the, for the uh, not only for the community of, of scientific community or for the citizens, but the fact that this is a prudent uh, uh, kind of trans transparent work of how we spend the public's money because we're the public university we're already paid to do research and teach their children or, or even the wider community uh, about the uh, expertise we possess. Uh, and then we kind of hand over this, this research to, uh, uh, to, to uh, big publishers, not even local publishers. So the money kind of doesn't stay uh, in the local community. And, and that causes a lot of issues. And plus we have to publish in English, uh, English, German, French, but mostly English. Uh, which is not a, not a, we have to do that, of course, to communicate like we're doing it now, but still, uh, we also have to think of the, of the, the students of the community that not necessarily speaks English, 
uh, that well or any other foreign language uh, and and think of the, the ways to spread this knowledge. And I think open access is, is the way forward, but it needs to be kind of legalized in a sense. Uh, and, and this is really something that is hard to explain to, to the uh, politicians uh, because the publishers get scared. Then you have to, you have to actually think of the whole eco ecosystem that open licensing supports because every, everyone thinks that open licensing is, is something that you don't have to invest in, uh, but you do, but it's just a more, it's a better investment uh, uh, because then you, you invest in people and not in, in uh, infrastructures of, of different uh, companies. You invest in public infrastructure uh, and you open knowledge. And in turn, you actually have better economy, uh, uh, in my opinion. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Feda, for that. So we have another interesting question. And Victor, um, I want you to address this because it relates more with your areas of expertise. Uh, if we are talking about fake news, so can we trust newspapers that only depict one side of the coin like the most famous newspaper in India is, in, is the Hindu. So we can only trust 20% of the different newspapers published. So what are your views on this? Even some news, some news in some newspapers are fake. So Victor, uh, this is your areas of expertise, okay? If we are talking about fake news, can we trust newspapers that only depict uh, one side of the coin? Victor, over to you. Yeah, uh, this is a, a little bit uh, uh, dicey in the sense that uh, that's, that's why I said, that uh, people that are supposed to be trusted are no longer trusted, then it makes the work a little bit uh, uh, difficult. I will give you a practical example. Here in Nigeria, yesterday, I read in a particular newspaper, my colleague wrote the article, uh, the article and he said that there was uh, a, um, a suicide bomber in a particular community. I read the article. Now, you, you, you want to believe that they have done a lot of fact checking. In fact, in fact, the way they wrote the article, it was as if they were there, they saw what happened, and the article has been disseminated. Everybody saw it. So later in the evening, the state governor and the information experts in the community now found out that it wasn't a suicide bomber. So in that case, where do you even leave the ordinary citizen to even do? So there's a little bit of contrition there. But in answering that question, I will still go back to what I said earlier on that information literacy skill. If you, we have to keep teaching people how to handle information. We have to teach people how to recognize their biases when they see information online. I did not disseminate the information because personally, when I see an information online, I don't disseminate. I have to confirm. Sometimes I have to make calls. I have to make calls, maybe because it's my field. But what about those people that don't even have the time to do all those things? You understand? So we have to be more responsible, really. As librarians, mm -hmm. as newsmakers, we have to be more responsible. Now, uh, in, your, in your country, for instance, in dealing with that, uh, uh, in that, in that case, you personally have to learn the information literacy skills. So you need to confirm everything. Just as I said, if your mother said that love, she loves you, confirm it. Let her prove it. So when you see a particular newspaper source, you don't just share. But most times, the reason why you share is because of your bias. You want to confirm that the, your government is bad. So you saw something that is confirming that your government is bad. So you're sharing it. So your own bias is all these plain parts in it. So when you see information, has it? And, and let me just quickly say this. As librarians, you have a brand to protect. You yourself is a you're a brand, and you can't be that kind of brand that always disseminates fake news. So, because I believe I'm a brand, I want to double check everything that I'm. Saying. So, when I go the extra mile to make calls to confirm. So, I, I would advise that whenever you see any information, irrespective of who is sending it, even if it is CNN, even if it is either, regardless of the, the, the news platform, suspect it suspect it, be curious, and then make more information, ask more information about it. And in adding up that, sometimes what I do to my contacts, I say that when you see an information and you cannot confirm it, because not everybody have the time to go and be confirming an information. So what I do is that you send it to me. I have them on WhatsApp, I'll tell my contact, send it to me, let me go confirm it for you before you start sending out the information. In that way, I'm playing my part as a librarian to educate people that this part, this is what you, it's stressful, I won't lie. You have to go the extra mile to do this thing. It's stressful, but this needs to be done, especially WhatsApp. So this needs to be done. Thank you so much, Amy. Uh, thank you very much, Victor, for that insight. Uh, Professor Yasa Sonsa, what's your take on this particular question? Um, <clears throat> I think um, the, um, 
ecosystem approach uh, perhaps uh, should be um, uh, the way uh, to take in this case libraries alone cannot of course um, you know reverse everything that uh, is not uh, too good nowadays by ecosystem i mean um, of course the uh, primary role of libraries is to actually um, uh, provide some um, infodemics information literacy uh, um, trainings but um, uh, since libraries themselves are not the source of actually uh, spreading uh, fake information, uh, the other entities should also be uh, uh, in the play uh, here, publishers, uh, um, you know, social media companies, um, online news providers, etc. So I think in addition to um, the um, uh, transparency of information sources to ver verify what's going on, uh, we should also have uh, some kind of regulations uh, as to um, actually um, have some democratic oversight on those um, news spreading organizations and also sanctions as well. Uh, we've seen this uh, during the Trump administration in the social media part as well. Uh, so I think uh, the main contribution of the uh, memory institutions would be perhaps to uh, actually uh, make um, their users aware that um, uh, they have to be skeptical, they have to check their sources once, twice, three times, etc. They should um, um, question the authority of the source as well as the author um, and uh, uh, also um, uh, seek for professional help uh, if needed. Uh, I mean, um, libraries are the best places to go uh, for uh, professional help. Uh, we have um, um, colleagues uh, you know, um, specialized in almost uh, every field in libraries, uh, including infodemics, uh, for instance. One more thing I would add about this is that um, I think uh, we will see more and more uh, oversight uh, based on um, automated um, tools like artificial intelligence based fact checking programs. They are already being uh, used successfully. I mean, and they are getting better and better because, um, you know, you can spread fake news through artificial intelligence programs, but also you also develop uh, artificial intelligence programs. They can uh, actually catch much better uh, if the uh, news uh, uh, is fake or whatever. So uh, those um, can, uh, I think we will see more and more of uh, usage of such uh, things uh, similar to, for instance, um, uh, programs that uh, spot uh, spams uh, in your mailbox. Um, but um, the responsibility is also um, on the uh, news uh, um, distributing channels, including the social media, etc. And this is where the regulations uh, should come into being. In other words, nowadays, uh, such um, platforms are responsible for the fake news that they distribute as we all know right mm -hmm. i think this um this should be a uh, part of the solution at least but of course as the end users we are not bound with you know such things uh, most of the time unless our name is trump uh, uh otherwise um, uh, the uh, information retrieval systems based on very crude um keywords matching, etc. However, uh, the uh, techniques that I mentioned about um, artificial intelligence and machine learning go beyond that because um, they can also fact check, they can also look at the sentiment uh, in the um, uh, message, whether it is um, uh, a joke or something else, and then um, sort of warn the um, uh, user that uh, this may actually not be uh, an accurate piece of information. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Professor Yasa, for that. So I'll be going through the chat, but also I'm seeing some interesting conversation here. I'm going to have your questions to that already. Uh, um, uh, Tina, I'll, I'll love to take this question. Um, how concerned are we 
that we are relying so heavily on Google for open access, okay? Uh, when they are a business who uses their own algorithm uh, to choose what they catalog and promote. Uh, Tina, over to you. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. We had a lively chat uh, discussion in the chat already uh, on this topic. Um, this question is absolutely relevant. I mean, the internet uh, nowadays really uh, it works based on, on uh, monetization of people's attention online, whether it's on social media, on, on search engines or, or anywhere else. Um, and all of these uh, platforms do uh, curate the information on what a person sees. They're very targeted to, to uh, what we see as individuals. What I see as myself sitting in Geneva right now, uh, typing in the same search term in Google will be very different than what any of you type in because you are in a different country um, and you have a different user profile uh online and this definitely is a problem meaning that uh there is no universal access to information it's almost like you know we all logged into wikipedia and we would see a customized page for wikipedia <laughs> and this is something that people do not really uh fully um understand on how internet works nowadays so this brings me to what was mentioned earlier i totally agree i mean we do need to work on how to regulate um, uh, access to, uh, to information. Now, one piece is definitely to promote um, accurate information. For example, you've seen uh, platforms right now promoting in collaboration with health authorities and WHO uh, information on Google and, and Facebook, uh, etc. But that's really not enough because it actually doesn't solve the problem of how content algorithms, content promotion algorithms actually work. And it doesn't resolve the issue that people uh, are vulnerable to such uh, misinformation. Uh, so we do need to look, uh, there, there's definitely two things that are happening at the same time. One is a movement to, for co-regulation of the platforms together with civil society, not only regulators. And uh, the second really, we do need to have some regulation to ensure transparency that the platforms give us the data that allows us to confirm <laughs> the effect of the policies, the content curation policies that they actually say uh, are, are being introduced. Currently, there's no way for independent confirmation of the success or of the actions on content curation. And we do need to uh, achieve some kind of uh, ac um, uh, access to to data and metadata that would allow us then to have a picture. Uh, and then of course, information researchers could, uh, could sort of work research around that. But uh, those are two pieces that are very important. While I agree that regulation is important, we need to be really careful how to do it because um, what we've seen uh, the last year is that mm -hmm. well-intentioned policies that try to prevent spread of misinformation can actually be used to stifle free speech as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Feda, do uh, you have any comments on this? Questions? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, I mean, basically, <laughs> Tina said everything I wanted to say uh, in a sense, but but basically, yeah, algorithms are, are really an issue uh, uh, for us. And, and uh, there was a discussion with my students and so on uh, that they don't realize how, how they live in an information bubble and that even not it's not even a question of like these geographic locations that are dispersed but even in 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 the same location based on their needs and, and whatever they they're differently treated and and serve different information and this is a problem that um it we have to deal with uh because um my mom receives different information even though she lives in the same place i do uh, and then i have to tell her like okay this is not true uh just solely based on her age actually sometimes mm. not only on, on anything else so so this is something that we have to deal with as a library community particularly uh, in warning uh, uh the users uh that uh, 
algorithms are not always the best solution. And that's why we're not using them in library information systems uh, uh, mostly because then we will just lock them in in, in their information bubble le reading just crime novels or any other novels. Uh, and that communication with people is better. Uh, uh, in terms of regulation, uh, since I've been involved in, in different projects that are not, um, not library related, but media related, uh, and we have had this discussion for a long time in the Vulcan, whether we should do self-regulation or, or, or some kind of legal regulation of, of, um, of media uh, uh, environment. Uh, I think the problem is the definition of media. We, I would really like to, to have some kind of uh, legalized version of, of, of the definition of media. So, so in that sense, but uh, that needs to come from the community. Uh, right now, all of the attempts, uh, uh, except I think in Serbia, they had some success with that, have which is still not working, by the way. But never mind. Uh, 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 kind of go into actually undemocratic attempts. Um, uh, I I kind of run the project where where uh, one of the the governments in in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, because we have fourteen, uh, has has uh, passed a law that internet is a public space and therefore whatever you say in the internet uh, can be treated as a violation of of, of uh, uh, a public disturbance. Uh, it hasn't been used uh, a lot, but it we worked on on trying to to uh, kind of uh, uh, abolish it. And uh, my work there was to, to include everyone from, from the right and the left, telling them that like this kind of law will, will hit you in the head eventually. So any kind of, prevent, uh, kind of um, censorship is something we should fight against. And I think that uh, uh, censorship is even uh, more dangerous than uh, infodemic. Thank you very much, uh, Feda, for that insight uh, into this subject matter. Uh, to our speakers, thank you very much for, for the insight you shared with us in this conversation. We surely we really appreciate uh, your experience that you shared with us today. And uh, just a closing remarks from our speakers, uh, just in 30 seconds. Uh, Victor, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. It has been an amazing day. Um, as I only said, uh, what I said earlier on before is that uh, uh, there's something that uh, Tina mentioned, which is the, the information hygiene. We need to make use of this in dealing with information. And we can't go wrong with verifying any information we want to put out. Okay, so let's let's take, uh, let's do the extra work. Let's do the extra work by going out all out to do the extra added to our, uh, to our ordinary, by confirming whatever we are sharing, by teaching people, because uh, the, the, the easiest way to even do it is if you can get like, like 20 people and you teach them like information literacy skill. You have empowered them to go teach another set of people information literacy skill. In that way, we are gradually taking over by every uh, 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 by verifying whatever we see online. So let's just make, uh, uh, let's, let's take intentional efforts. I will say that, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Yasser, uh, over to you, sir. Uh, thank you. I think uh, what I gather from uh, what uh, all speakers said about um, uh, the ecosystem, so to speak. Uh, uh, this tells us that uh, we really need a public information infrastructure. I mean, uh, it's not the algorithms to blame, uh, it's the uh, way we use them. Usually the way uh, 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 private companies use them to um, steal our attention is not the best use, we all know that. However, when it is used properly, uh, it could also uh, help the other way around. In other words, filtering the uh, fake news, for instance. It's just that um, right now in this ecosystem, the commercial interests um, are dominant, unfortunately. So even if you have perfect regulations, uh, uh, still, um, I think um, the end users, uh, one way or another, would get this if they want to. I, I, I appreciate the, um, uh, the uh, freedom of uh, expression part as well, but I think uh, if we have uh, more control over the uh, public information um, infrastructure, then perhaps uh, such uh, fake news items or fake information sources uh, would uh, slip in um, 
uh, less and less. It's just that um, mm. somehow we have a mixed um, 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 ecosystem where different players uh, are, have their um, different agendas. And as uh, memory institutions, uh, not only universities, but also other um, public institutions should be able to have a, um, a, a, an information structure um, uh, supported by mainly um, uh, public money, so to speak. And uh, of course, it's going to touch the base with the commercial companies as well. But just like the uh, commercial uh, journal articles, we can actually uh, do something about it. Uh, the uh, present situation is uh, uh, more or about the short term uh, uh, the information that um, we uh, consume in a, a short amount of time. This is uh, the uh, hurdle, I suppose, uh, before us in the coming uh, years. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Yasser, for that uh, wonderful closure. Uh, so, Feda, briefly, 30 seconds, or just closing remarks for the participants. Uh, okay. Uh, first of all, I would I would thank, like to thank you all uh, again for for this opportunity. But uh, what I I I think that uh, freedom of expression is crucial for librarians. Uh, this is this is the the ultimate fight for us, and and this is what I would say. Uh, and uh, it is the ultimate fight to uh, not erase anyone from history. I always tell my students that we are probably one of the most powerful professions in the world because we truly can delete people from history. Uh, if you delete the book from the history that someone wrote, you, you delete the knowledge. Uh, and, and it can happen if we don't take the responsibility. So we do, uh, we always emphasize ethics and ethics is uh, apart from teaching information literacy and media literacy, which is important. It is important to teach information ethics, not only uh, for to library uh, science students or information scientists, but anyone else. Uh, and uh, particularly, uh, I would finally say that technology is not the enemy. It is an our uh, ally and algorithms are a good thing. Machine learning is a good thing. I've, I've seen good examples and I agree with, with Professor, but the biases built into them are a bad thing. And we need to talk about the biases always. Uh, uh, library science has always been predominantly a, a female profession, but uh, their voice hasn't been heard always. And, and that's what we're also trying to, uh, most of my students are, are, are women. They're scared of technology. And I try to tell them like web design is the thing that you do. It's not, it's not just male thing. Uh, and and uh, I, of course I have to challenge my biases as well. And we all have to, and I think this is the the, the most important thing. So freedom of uh, freedom of expression, information ethics, and technology is not the enemy are three points that I would like to make. And the fourth final one, the biases are the enemy. Thank you very much, Freda. Uh, so Tina, uh, last comments in just 30 seconds. Thank you very much. Now over to you. I just underline uh, what Pedro said. It's, um, I totally agree. Uh, technology is not the enemy. We need to look at ethical use of technology and uh, promote resilience uh, to misinformation, but then but and media and information literacy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Soa. Speaker has been an interesting uh, conversation. Uh, Speaker, learning from your uh, experience and knowledge. So at this point, I'm going to call on my colleague uh, Nile to take it away from here. Nile, over to you. Thank you, Damnari. Thanks a lot for our uh, great presenters and also to our audience because they contributed a lot with their comments and questions. So before we end our session, we have the second and the last uh, short survey with the same question to see if your decision has changed at all after all the presentations. So the same question, how well have libraries done in preventing fake news during the pandemic? How well have libraries done in preventing fake news during the pandemic? Five, four, three, two, one. 
Okay, I think uh, I've realized some optimism here. Still majority says okay, but I guess uh, people uh, a bit change their ideas towards uh, positive. Thank you, Stefan. Damlari, the store, sorry, the floor is yours. So thank you very much, Nile and Selim, for the poll. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, finally, we have come to the end of the presentation. We would like to say thank you very much to all our participants uh, for staying to this time and also to our speakers uh, for this interesting conversation. Uh, thank you, Tina, Victor, uh, Freda, uh, Professor Yasa, and Dr. Erwin uh, for sharing your experience uh, with us in this uh, webinar. Uh, thank you also, our audience, for your active uh, participation. And the huge appreciation also goes to uh, Stephen Weiber from IFLA and Gosia uh, Kabaj from Gute Institute for your support on realizing the webinar. And also, gratitude also goes uh, to my fellow amazing uh, Imad International Voices Fellow and my colleagues uh, for your commitment and efforts to make this day uh, a possibility and a reality. Okay, so Renin, uh, Nile, Elia, Rita, and Naomi, thank you very much uh, for your commitment and, and resilience towards uh, this webinar. So um, we will share you the recording of this webinar, which will be accessible uh, later on, uh, as, uh, so you can go back to reference. So as we end this particular conversation, thank you very much for joining us for this webinar. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, and good morning, wherever you are. And uh, stay safe and stay healthy. Bye for now. Goodbye. Yeah, bye. Yeah.